uh, my daughter, she's going to think it's fairly limiting. You know, so, social and uh, opportunities of that sort of thing may be different or less than the current environment that she finds herself in. Um, and then, you know, how do I structure it as a, a kind of a my, our problem? Um, let's see, can we scroll that up? Let me see if I can move that. Hang on a second. Yeah, okay, so that's everything there. And I got it. It's t is it, uh, tick the box, right? There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so there's the goal. I kind of gave it to you in a nutshell, which is to successfully start up this uh, medical sterilization business, grow its business volume over the course of roughly about three to five years, which is very doable with uh, certain approaches that I think we can take in terms of uh, expanding the technology base, offering different sterilization techniques. I won't get into those details, but you kind of understand that there is a structured way to do this. So what are the pros of the change? Um, I have actually been working with this company for almost 20 years, and I happen to know every single member of the staff. I know their roles. I know the work products that they have to produce. I understand the processes that this business uses day in and day out. It's also a packaging business, and I'm an expert packaging designer, so I really have a hands-on feel, a tactile feel for how this business runs day to day. The current CEO of the company knows that I'm probably one of the very few people who could just walk in the front door, have re relationships with everyone in the business right off the bat, and understand how the business operates. So it puts me in a very unique position. Um, what are the pros of no change? Well, I'm in the Bay Area. There are many, many medical device companies uh, in the area that need people with my skills. Central California, as I've stated, not so much. That pretty much sums up that box. <laughs> uh, the change solution, you know, I have to change my willingness, number one, I have to own that part, to leave a highly metropolitan area and take a risk in a much more rural area. And so that's a significant sort of change of perspective on my part that would have to take place. Um, and I think there's a little bit more there. Let me just scroll that down a little bit so you guys can see it. Sorry for... Oh, okay. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I'm going to stay out of the way, so I'll be behind you guys a little bit so you can see it. I don't want to block the projector. Okay, so, you know, I, I also have to change my risk aversion to the potential of failure, which is, you know, always a big deal when you're going to make a big jump like that. Uh, I'm confident that the plans will work. I'm confident that the business is functioning and has profit potential. Uh, but there's always, you know, a potential for failure, and I have to kind of register that and process it. Okay. Yep. Okay, no change. Well, right now that's pretty simple. <laughs> you can procrastinate all you want, but eventually the opportunity will go away, or I'm not a singularly unique individual in the marketplace. There are other people with my skills in the marketplace. Someone, could, someone else could fill that role. So there's, a, there's that potential uh, that could take place as well. Okay, where's my mouse? Oops, sorry. Okay, so the cons of change, geographic distance and location, that's unique to this particular opportunity. Um, I think I mentioned number two, and number three is business oriented. The local talent pool, because of where it's located, is primarily agribusiness. It's, uh, for those of you who know Central California on the coastal side, it's very big in the wine industry. So there's a lot of chemical engineers, there's mechanical engineers, but people with med device experience specifically, maybe regulated FDA type of experience, don't exist in that environment. So that's a bit more of a challenge. Okay, cons of no change. I get to stay in the Bay Area. If, the, if you're familiar with it or any large metropolitan area in the current housing environment of the United States, you know what that's like. Uh, and then, of course, dealing with the commute. If you live in a large metropolitan area like LA, San Francisco, or San Diego, you know what that can be like, right? Two hours plus, even on public transit, it's not great. Uh, 
Okay, and then I think the last one, uh, the major threat, you know, I listed the business one here, um, so I'll let you guys read that. I won't, I won't read it to you. You can read that, but I'll just share with you um, that I think even a bigger threat than that is that the, the family could become dysfunctional if I don't consider their emotions, needs, and perspectives effectively. And so that makes it challenging for me to kind of, how do I open up that discussion without making them feel threatened, uh, without making them feel like I'm trying to push the decision? Because uh, at the moment, I'm ambivalent. I've been procrastinating. So that's where I'm at. And thanks for letting me share such a personal decision. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Anastasia, and I just um, remind that um, I'm, a, I'm a medical doctor originally, so I was a psychiatrist in my country, and now I moved to the U.S. and I'm doing research, uh, so I'm a postdoctoral fellow. And I'm planning to enter a medical residency program, but I don't know which residency to choose. On one hand, I could continue my psychiatric career. On the other hand, I would like to switch to other completely different field of oncology and cancer research. This is internal uh, medicine residency. So this is my major problem. What residency program to choose? So the challenge is to switch to completely different area. Um. So my uh, like local impact, local impact is um, I want to be maximally useful as a doctor, right? I want to maximally use my potential. If I'm feeling that I'm can be applicable in different sphere, which is maybe more important, then I want to apply myself there. Uh, so what are the pros to change? Uh, first, well, let, let's maybe start with uh, cons to change. Um, just a second. Um, Cost to change, cons of change. Um, so first of all, I will have to uh, learn completely different fields, so new drugs, new symptoms, um, new concepts. Uh, I'm, I know this, but I have to refresh everything and go very much deep into every new topic, uh, into every new illness. Uh, then I have to have some physical contact with patients, right? Because we, when you provide some uh, care, uh, you need to make uh, assessments, right? And it sometimes involves physical contact. Um, the second, the next thing is there are many uh, day and night shifts during the residency program if it's internal medicine. So you have to spend this time in hospital and deal with all range of different situations, including emergency and um, mortality, like life-threatening situations and maybe even death of people which we usually don't have in psychiatry. Also, there is something about um, uh, betraying my specialization because in my um, society of colleagues of psychiatrists, they support me in my psychiatric career and they really don't understand how can I even consider some other option because they love the work and I also uh, love my work but just wanna be more helpful. Uh, and also, if I make a career switch that usually impedes people's trust, for example, if they look at c on the CV, uh, they see that's a little bit strange that person was have spent half of career in one sphere and then for some reason she switched. It's a little bit suspicious and may not be so uh, attractive for a potential employer. What are the pros of change, like pluses? First of all, uh, I will be able to deal with concrete entities entities, rather than some abstract things. For example, tumors. I can uh, exactly touch it, see what's the size of it, how, how fast does it progress. Uh, so I don't have to talk about such abstract things as uh, thinking, consciousness, um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, delusions, for example, which are hard to explain, which are very hard to prove also. Uh, I don't have to fight with patients and um, relatives about the, um, the reality of the disease because our patients have very low insight. They don't realize that it, they are ill and they're not compliant. So I always have to deal with uh, convincing them to take the medication and they're still not taking it. So it's kind of a little bit useless work that we're doing. Uh, also, I would have very clear understanding of the subject of the 
um, of my work, like what exactly are the mechanisms of the disease, I would understand very clearly uh, where does it come from. Uh, whereas in psychiatry, we don't really understand uh, what are the disorders, how do they appear. We know a lot of different facts uh, from the pathophysiology, but they're not connected in holistic picture and there is no clarity on pathogenesis. And uh, I would also have a wide range of therapeutic skills. So if my relatives or friend would have any medical problems, like somatic, physical, I could easily and readily advise them something. Um, so I would be very competent in a wide range of pathology, not just in mental illness. Uh, and I could easily manage it just by prescribing different medicine <laughs> to myself too. <laughs> Yes, sure. So, but I think still it, it's quite unique because if you're dealing with cancer, you have really much higher salary and higher prestige of profession. Nobody believes in psychiatrists. It's a huge stigma existing in our area. It's very unique for psychiatry. No other sphere of medicine experiences this. Okay, so finally we have uh, pros of no change. Uh, again, I can stay within my comfort zone. I can operate with my, with my strong sides because I already have skills and knowledge in psychiatry and I can deepen my competency in this one particular sphere and um, I can have consistency in career and good strong CV. Um, and the final thing is um, cons of no change. Sorry. Sorry, <laughs> maybe there is lag. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah, here it is. Okay, um, if I do not change, if I do not transfer to other uh, area, then um, I will have to continue deal with very vague and abstract symptoms which cannot be explained, very abstract concepts that people do not even believe in. Uh, again, deal with low insight, non-compliance, uh, constant dissatisfaction with myself that I could do more, but I did not do, and lose an opportunity to help cancer people, and again, staying is in less prestige profession with this huge stigma and re with relatively small salary, and um, experience also my relatives' disappointment because they also don't really believe in psychiatry and would like me to do something physical. <laughs> That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you. So for those that are working with businesses or, or have your own business, you, you might be able to resonate with this. So the problem is current operational or financial performance is still below expectations, and you can see why that is bad for you and why it's bad for the company. So what's a conflict? You feel pressure to make sure that everybody has enough of everything, that they do not lack resources, to achieve the targets that have been set for them, right? And you'll hear that feedback, you want me to do more, give me more resources, more better systems, whatever it is, but make sure you have enough of everything. At the same time, the status quo, the no change part, is to continue to try and get by on the bare minimum. So have enough with a bit of a buffer versus get by on the bare minimum. Each of these have got their unique pros. Having enough means that I can continuously protect and, and improve my sales side, for example, make sure that my sales is growing. Getting by on the bare minimum shows that I'm constantly fighting to reduce costs and control cost. And both of those are requirements to achieve and sustain profitable growth. At the same time, they also have negatives. So if I really ask to get enough of everything, 
there's a big risk that people will ask for too much and will have very low rates of returns and our cost per unit will go up and there will be resistance from some parts in the business to this. Why are they getting more, not us? Whereas if you're really forcing people to get by on the bare minimum, the bottleneck will constantly move. You'll be firefighting all the time. And any one of those means that you will compromise the goal of achieving and sustaining profitable growth. So how do you resolve a conflict like this when the assumptions is quite deep? So getting by on a bare minimum means I've committed to 10 and I've got a little process here. Each process can do 10, right? So that's getting by on a bare minimum. There's no buffer here. We want to commit to 10. Each of these processes can do 10. This side says getting, having enough means my bottleneck can do 10. Everything in front of it can do more. So it makes sure that the bottleneck is never starved. Everything behind it can do more, make sure it's never blocked. And that system we can guarantee to get 10 out. So the assumptions that we're testing here, if I want the organization to adopt this approach, the assumptions I will have to challenge, and that means this is a change plus plus option, is that I would need to figure out how can I get them to have enough of everything without losing this benefit, which says that we are showing that we are constantly fighting to control cost and not get this one, which is that our cost per unit will go up and we'll become uncompetitive. Now, this is one of those where logically I can explain to you the logic of why the left-hand side is a better option than the right-hand side. But that doesn't mean you'll do it. And the reason for the logic, it's not intuitive. You actually need to build a simple simulation model to show you that not only the left will give me the best sales, but it will give me also the lowest cost per unit. So if you think about this, if the reliability of each of these is, say, 90%, how much will this system get out? You can't say it's 10 times 90%, so we'll get out 9. You have to say, I'm not sure what's, oh, come on, what's happened to our, analysis here. You can't say it will get out 9, which is 90% times 10. It is 90% times 90% times 90% times 90%. That's probability mathematics, which ends up getting you 6 rather than 9. So you expect to get 9 because you've got an availability or reliability of 90%, but because they are interdependent and coupled, a breakdown there automatically impacts everybody else because there's no buffer. So you expect to get nine, you get only six. Whereas here, you've protected the bottleneck. So the only question is what's the availability of the bottleneck, which is 90%, so you can get nine out. So if you get nine, even if you paid more, so assume that each of these resources to get 10, you'll have to pay $10. So five resources times 10 gives you $50. Here you've put in some additional buffer. So these add up to $60. So it's, it looks like it's less efficient. It will cost you more to run this system than that one. But look at what happens when we calculate the cost per unit, right? Which is 60 divided by 9 gives me 6.67 versus 50 divided by 6 gives me $8.33 per unit. So this is one of those examples where it's the combination of understanding the fears that's blocking somebody to have the most optimum design, which is this one, and why there's continuous pressure through de-bottlenecking and layoffs to create this system that we think is the most efficient and will help us to reduce the overhead that helps us to protect against the downtime, but actually it's causing our cost of unit to keep on going up. Okay? So it's an example of how we can use this rational, logical way of thinking together with simulations to see, is this assumption really true? Let's build a small model and see. Okay? So just an example for those that are interested in this. What we'd like to do now is to go on to step three. And the reason why I'm rushing this a little bit is I want to show you that if you don't procrastinate, 
that by slowing down your thinking, you're speeding up decision making. Right? So don't slow it down too much. Don't procrastinate too much. Just focus on answering the questions and you'll see there are safety nets. If you missed something in step two, there's a safety net in step three or in step four that will pick it up. What I'd like to do now is rather than me explaining step three again, I'm going to show you a video that we've created that we use as a kind of a do-it-yourself. So we've done tests at schools and in organizations with HR that says if all we show them is the next video and we give them the app, can they use this method? And the results have been quite positive. Constantly, of course, we're trying to make it simpler, etc. But let's uh, go through the video.